Thank you. Uh, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, Chairman Gordon, uh, Ranking Member Hall, uh, members of the committee, I'm Bill Gates and I'm the Chairman of Microsoft. With my wife Melinda, I'm also the founder of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And it's an honor to be here uh, to commemorate your 50th anniversary. During these 50 years, incredible advances in science and technology have revolutionized the way people around the world communicate, run businesses, find information, and much more. I'm optimistic that over the decades ahead, information technology will continue to transform business productivity and have a profound positive impact on our day-to-day -day lives. It will also help us address important global challenges related to education, healthcare, energy, and other issues. Many of the key advances of these 50 years were pioneered by researchers working in U.S. universities and for U.S. companies. U.S. preeminence in science and technology and this nation's unmatched ability to turn innovation into thriving business have long been the engine of job creation and the source of our global economic leadership. I know we all want the U.S. to continue to be the world center for innovation, but our position is at risk. There are many reasons for this, but two stand out. First, U.S. companies face a severe shortfall of scientists and engineers with expertise to develop the next generation of breakthroughs. Second, we don't invest enough as a nation in the basic research needed to drive long-term innovation. If we don't reverse these trends, our competitive advantage will erode. Our ability to create new high-paying jobs will suffer. Addressing these issues will take commitment, leadership, and partnership on the part of government, private, and nonprofit sectors. Let me start by saying that business has a critical role to play. The private sector must contribute to building a workforce that has the skills to innovate and compete. That's why Microsoft is committed to improving educational quality and encouraging young people to study math and science through programs like Partners in Learning which has reached more than 80,000 teachers and 3 million students. Nonprofit organizations also have an important role to play. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for its part, has invested almost $2 billion to help establish or improve nearly 2,000 U.S. high schools and provided over $1.7 billion for college scholarship programs. But organizations like these cannot address the issues alone. Only government has the resources to affect change on a broad scale. If this nation is to continue to be at the global center of innovation, Congress, the current administration, and the next president must act decisively. It starts with education. Today, graduation rates for our high school students and their level of achievement in math and science rank at the bottom among industrialized nations. 30% of ninth graders and nearly half of African Americans and Hispanic ninth graders do not graduate on time. Fewer than 40% of high school students graduate ready to attend college. As a nation, we must have a fundamental goal that every child in the U.S. should graduate from high school prepared for college, career, and life. To achieve this, we need metrics that reflect what students learn and the progress they make. Such metrics may be difficult to develop, but they provide the essential foundation for deciding which programs best improve outcomes in our public schools. Better data will also help us identify the most effective teachers and adopt better policies for recruiting, training, and retaining these teachers for our public schools. If the problem with high schools is one of quality, the issue is at our universities is quantity. Our higher education system doesn't produce enough top scientists and engineers to meet the need of the U.S. economy. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, we are adding over 100,000 new computer-related jobs each year. But only 15,000 students earned bachelor degrees in computer science and engineering in 2006. And that number continues to drop. One of the most important steps Congress can take to address this problem is to fully fund the America Competes Act. Introduced by this committee, 
This act would significantly increase funding for the National Science Foundation's graduate fellowship and traineeship programs. As bad as the disparity between supply and demand looks, these numbers understate the severity of the problem. Today, our university computer science and engineering programs include large numbers of foreign students. In fact, the Science and Engineering Indicators Report showed that 59% of doctoral degrees and 43% of all higher ed degrees in engineering and computer science are awarded to temporary residents. But our current immigration policies make it increasingly difficult for these students to remain in the United States. At a time when talent is the key to economic success, it makes no sense to educate people in our universities, often subsidized by U.S. taxpayers, and then insist that they return home. U.S. innovation has always been based in part on the contribution of foreign-born scientists and researchers. For example, a recent survey uh, conducted by several universities showed that between 1995 and 2005, firms with at least one foreign-born founder created 450,000 new U.S. jobs. Moreover, as a recent study uh, shows, for every H-1B holder that technology companies hire, five additional jobs are created around that person. But as you know, our immigration system makes it very difficult for U.S. firms to hire highly skilled foreign workers. Last year at Microsoft, we were unable to obtain H-1B visas for over a third of our foreign-born candidates. An example is the story of our Pete Guglani, a talented young man who graduated from the University of Toronto. He graduated in 2006 and we offered him a job, but he has not been able to attain an H-1B visa for two straight years and we were forced to rescind his job offer. He's exactly the type of science and engineering graduate that we need to continue to add jobs and drive innovation. There are a number of steps that Congress and the White House should take to address this problem, including extending the period that foreign students can work here after graduation, increasing the current cap on H-1B visas, clearing a path to permanent residency for high-skilled foreign-born employees, eliminating per-country green card limits, and significantly increasing the annual number of green cards. I want to emphasize that to address the shortage of scientists and engineers, we must do both, reform our education system and our immigration policies. If we don't, American companies simply, simply will not have the talent they need to innovate and compete. Finally, we must increase our investment in basic scientific research. In the past, federally funded research helped spark industries that today provide hundreds of thousands of jobs. Even though we know that basic research drives economic progress, real federal spending on research has fallen since 2005. I urge Congress to increase funding for basic research by 10% annually for the next seven years. I fully support Congress, Congress's efforts to fund basic research through the America Competes Act. I believe the country is at a crossroads. For decades, innovation has been our engine of prosperity. Now economic progress depends more than ever on innovation. Without leadership from Congress and the President to implement policies like those I've outlined today, and the commitment of the private sector to do its part, the center of progress can shift to other nations that are more committed to the pursuit of innovation. I'm going to conclude by again congratulating the committee on its 50th anniversary and to thank you for this opportunity to share my perspective. I'd be happy to respond to any questions you may have on these topics.